now on to our last presenter of the day. I think we're all in, uh, in the mood and all uh, ready for some coffee cocktails. And uh, very excited to have our last presenter here today. Uh, it is, of course, Dan Fellows, who was uh, the UK Barista Champion in 2016. And he has since uh, gone on to uh, win the World Coffee in Good Spirits competition twice in a row. Uh, he has uh, uh, been consulting lots of different businesses on how to uh, yeah, just uh, run uh, uh, these kind of workshops and, uh, and, and sharing great recipes with people during his Coffee Cocktail Fridays. And uh, I'm very excited to have him here today as the last speaker. Uh, he's going to show you how to make an espresso martini, and uh, he calls it a shake-along. I'm super excited. Unfortunately, we don't have the right tools to participate right here. Uh, but I also wanted to quickly just thank the Hoxton uh, for hosting us here today. We are very grateful and very, very thankful that uh, we had access to this beautiful space called The Apartment. So if you ever come to Amsterdam or you visit any of the other cities where they are based, uh, you should definitely go check them out and stay there because it's a wonderful hotel. And also thank you uh, to our wonderful uh, uh, helpers and assistants and producers, Martin uh, and Michael, who have been so, so wonderful today trying to help me to get through this uh, amazing event. And uh, yeah, so without further ado, I would like to welcome Dan Fellows. Can we put him on the screen? Hello. Hey, there hey, you are. Hey. Hey Hi. Dan, nice to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join us today for the last part of this event. Uh, it's really, really nice to have you. Uh, maybe just briefly, how are you? I'm good, yeah. Uh, it's been a bit of a weird lockdown for us. We had our first child on the first day of lockdown, more or less. So oh wow. Quite busy, uh, trying to juggle working from home and being a dad for the first time. So. Yeah, Wonderful, very... congratulations. I mean, that is quite, a, that is quite an amazing situation. Uh, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, to, to build a bond with your child, uh, it's been quite amazing to be there the whole time and, and watch, it, uh, watch it grow, right? Yeah, we've been very lucky. He's, uh, well, 15 weeks old now, so three and a bit months. Right. Um, but yeah, time's flown by. I think our experience of lockdown has been quite different in that every day has just flown by within seconds. So yeah, yeah it's been fun. I can imagine. And you also moved. Uh, you also moved to Cornwall, right? So uh, that must be quite nice to be uh, in a more uh, quiet place than uh, hectic London. Yeah, I think um, there are a lot of blessings in that. Having a bit of outdoor space, having sunshine, having the beach. It's been very yeah. good. But yeah. Amazing. Yeah. All right. So uh, you actually asked us in a, in advance to uh, share with our participants that they could <laughs> use a couple of uh, ingredients and tools to participate in this uh, workshop in real time. So yep. uh, without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to you and we're going to watch and listen to you um, make this amazing uh, cocktail and then we'll be back uh, towards the end of your, uh, your performance, I would call it, uh, and see if people have questions. Uh, I'm very excited to see what you've got for us. So over to you. So can you see this? We can. Wonderful. So we're going to have a coffee cocktail shake along. Um, this is something I've never actually done before vi uh, virtually. So it should be quite fun to see people get involved and uh, make themselves some coffee cocktails. So this is my name. Alex has done a great job of introducing me. Uh, you can follow along here on Dan Fellows. My brief background, which Alex has already covered, is coffee and good spirits, which is kind of bridging the gap between coffee and cocktails, which I feel very fortunate. These are two of my biggest passions and kind of hobbies in life anyway. So being able to bring the two together is a very big privilege for me. Before World Coffee and Good Spirits, I did a lot of uh, other competitions. I spent a lot of time not winning competitions, which I think people probably don't realize. Um, so you've got to kind of keep going with these things. My first kind of, my, well, my first Barista Championship win was in 2016. And before this, I was doing the Barista Championship and Coffee and Good Spirits uh, Nationals as well. So now, I, like I say, I'm very lucky. I get to usually travel the world. Haven't been doing a lot of this recently with the lockdown, but. I'm doing kind of drinks consultancy. I've almost turned my kitchen into a bit of a studio nowadays, uh, talking about coffee, talking about cocktails, and how to bring the two together. So, as you say, without further ado, we shall do so. So, before I get into fundamentals of coffee cocktails, I should say there are no rules. So whatever you think might work, just give it a go. Coffee cocktails are amazing, they're tasty, they're delicious. Don't feel bound by any rules that you might read. But equally, these might give you a little help and hand along the way if you're not sure where to begin. So without 
obviously going into too much detail, it's very important to use high quality ingredients. So this covers your coffee, your spirits, your sweeteners, fruits, garnishes, salt, ice, making sure you're not using, you know, super watery ice, making sure you're using optimally fresh coffee, uh, high quality spirits. And within this, it's important to say the most expensive ingredients aren't necessarily the best. So when you're designing drinks, you need to have an end result in mind. And in order to get there, you don't have to spend the most money on, you know, your super prestige geishas, that kind of thing. You can use humble coffees, I guess, because a lot of the kind of delicate notes which are in those coffees will probably be lost with the other big ingredients as well. So don't feel like you have to break the bank to make delicious coffee cocktails. So don't feel any um, prohibition in doing this. Whatever you have to hand, you can make delicious drinks. So like when you're brewing coffee, you want to really understand what's going on there. So following a recipe is super important. So writing it down is really uh, gonna help you. If you make a really great coffee cocktail, you know how to recreate this, but equally if you make a really bad one, you can evaluate where it might have gone wrong. And I would always recommend, just like when I'm brewing coffee, try and change just one variable at a time if you can. Uh, if it's really far away from where you want it, you can maybe change a couple, but always be very careful so you understand exactly what effect each ingredient and change is having. And in that, make sure you understand your ingredients and taste them on their own as well. And most importantly, have fun. Coffee cocktails, like I say, are something that are really, really fun, easy to make. There's a huge spectrum of flavor, uh, aroma, different intensities, body you can create using coffee and alcohol. And it's coffee, it's alcohol, you're gonna have a good time. Even if it doesn't taste perfect to begin with, you've got a coffee cocktail, it's gonna give you a good evening to uh, get started. So the question that people always, always, always ask me, and they're, you know, they're either baristas, they're bartenders, they're family members, friends, whatever. They're like, I don't know where to start. So this is such a difficult question because there's no one place to start. But what we're gonna to do today is focus on one particular area. And I think this is a really approachable place to begin with. So most importantly, you need to understand your guest, or you need to understand your own preferences. So just like if you're a barista working behind a bar, if someone comes in and says, I'd like to order a coffee, what do you recommend? It's a pretty big spectrum to pull from if you don't understand what they like. So you might know your locals, you might know they have a particular um, flavor profile they love, a particular origin they love, a particular um, milk drink they love. So this is a really good starting point. And without knowing this information, you can't create the best drink for them. When it comes to actually beginning to make the drink, again, this is a huge, huge area. So you can either use coffee as the big fundamental core ingredient, which is where the drink tastes like coffee with some supporting ingredients. So obviously some examples of this would be an espresso martini. Obviously an Irish coffee is a big glass of coffee with a little bit of whiskey, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of cream, just to kind of bring a little bit of complexity in there. And this is a really good way to make uh, probably drinks people understand as coffee cocktails. So when people think of coffee cocktails, they might think of these two drinks, espresso martini, Irish coffee, a white and a black Russian. But beyond this kind of core range, people don't understand that coffee cocktails can go so much further. So if you can create drinks which have coffee at the core, but other ingredients which really embellish this and elevate the quality of coffee, then it's a really, really interesting starting point, but it's also familiar for your guests. So you can use the coffee as the fundamental ingredient. So without a great coffee, you'll never make a great coffee cocktail. And by understanding what the coffee brings, you can use other ingredients to really elevate this. And what I often compare it to is a signature drink in a barista competition. So judges in barista competitions really want that coffee to be the core dominant flavor of the drink. And when you're creating a drink which is in this style but with alcohol, you really want to just elevate what's already there and bring complementary and contrasting ingredients to really just bring that coffee to another level. Alternatively, you can use coffee as a secondary or supporting ingredient. So you can have a drink which already has its established flavor profile and you can use coffee to elevate this or bring a little bit of um, contrast to what's already there. So if you think of some kind of classic cocktails, You've got a Negroni, an old fashioned. These don't have coffee as an ingredient per se, 
but they work really well with coffee. So a coffee Negroni, you would use the coffee just to elevate the kind of bitterness, the sweetness, the acidity that's already there, but you don't want it to overpower the whole drink. Otherwise it'll be probably a little bit wishy-washy. It'd be a little bit confusing because the Negroni is such a clearly defined drink with the harmonious balance of acidity, sweetness and bitterness, and also that nice alcohol level by using that dilution. With an old fashioned, again, rather than perhaps using the bitters, you could use coffee as an ingredient. And anytime you see bitters in a drink, you can always substitute this out and bring in coffee. So I'll talk more about extraction later, probably not into the detail that Maxwell did, but you don't always have to brew optimally for drinking for cocktails. So if you're looking to bring bitterness, you can use your extraction to highlight that kind of real high sweetness, but also a little bit of bitterness in the drink. And then if you're adding it to a drink which has acidity and other kind of characteristics, you can bring balance. So it's really important to remember that, that coffee can be used as an ingredient. And as we all know, the range of kind of opportunity and flavors in coffee are so broad that if you can't find a good coffee for a cocktail, then you're not looking hard enough because there are so many different flavors, not only on the uh, flavor wheel, but beyond this that you can find in coffee, which is amazing to pair with alcohol. So number one, easiest place to start is classic cocktail recipes, which you then twist with coffee. So what I always say to people when they're developing a coffee cocktail, what's your favorite? You know, this is either to your guest or to someone who's aspiring to make coffee cocktails. And they might say Negroni, obviously we've spoken about this. Old fashioned, we've spoken about this. They might love something a little bit more cheesy like pina colada. Who doesn't love a pina colada? But when you're thinking about what coffee to bring into this drink, you need to make sure that it's complementary or contrasting. So a complementary flavor profile to a pina colada would be tropical, sweet, fruity, acidic, or it might be contrasting and bring something a little bit different. So you might get a really kind of chocolatey, nutty one that complements the kind of rounder notes of the coconut. So you wanna really think about what's already in the drink and any little opportunities you have to either build on something you love or bring something different is a really good place for coffee to kind of slot into that drink. And what you can do by choosing these amazing coffees uh, sorry, these amazing cocktails to begin with, you can create your own spin on these drinks and create something really unique. So again, you're gonna have to think about something, if it has an acidic element, you either want to complement this with something that has that brightness, or you want to contrast it with something that has a bit more body and really balance out those citric notes. So we might be talking a daiquiri, uh, caipirinha, uh, margarita, uh, um, mojito, sour. All of these drinks would work well with either a bright, sweet, Kind of coffee or a more heavy rich kind of coffee and i don't want to generalize too much but because we're working with such intense flavors you don't really need to agonize completely about the tiny tiny details but you think need to think about the bigger picture so how does this coffee fundamentally taste and how can i bring it back, bring out the best characteristics of it to work with this drink so the origin of the coffee is huge Thinking about you know, your Brazilian coffees, very, again, generally speaking, they're gonna have that big round body, chocolatey sweetness, caramelized nuts, that kind of thing. You wanna use this in probably your more espresso martini style drinks, which are kind of heavy, really creamy, thick, sweet. Whereas if you're thinking your Kenyans, your Africans, your Ethiopians generally, um, you're gonna get your lighter kind of juicier notes. And this might work in your kind of lighter cocktails. So you might wanna think, Shaken cocktails, you might want something heavier. Stirred cocktails, you might want something lighter. But whatever it is, you need to think about how that origin and the flavor profile it brings works with the other ingredients in your cocktail. The variety is huge. So anyone who's seen uh, any competition routines I've done in the past few years will probably know I love Pacamara. And this isn't my favorite coffee to drink whatsoever. I enjoy it, it's great. I really enjoy Pacamara with milk. Uh, and as an espresso, but it wouldn't be in my top five varieties to drink. And despite that, it's the go-to variety I choose for coffee cocktails. The reason for this, it just has incredible body, incredible intensity, and it has really, really great sweetness. So it's a perfect kind of pairing for coffee cocktails. Again, you don't have to use a geisha or super kind of interesting, uh, rare variety for coffee cocktails. In fact, you might not even want to, because actually there's so many uh, complex characteristics in those coffees that would be lost 
when you pair them with something big like a rum or even just your vodkas, that those delicate notes will probably be lost. So again, really thinking about the coffee you use for the purpose in which you're using is really, really important. Uh, I'm hesitant now to talk about roast and freshness after the kind of expert views all the way through the day. But as um, Joanna and Maxwell have spoken about, this has a huge effect on the characteristics of the cup. And this is something you need to think about. So again, hugely generalizing, if you're using a darker roast coffee, this is gonna bring one characteristic. Whereas if you're using a lighter roast coffee, it's gonna bring something different. And similarly, if it's super fresh, you're probably gonna get some of those brighter kind of CO2 notes with their slight sparkle. Whereas if it's been rested optimally or perhaps beyond this, you're gonna lose some of that. So all of these variables you need to factor in and think about what you're pairing it with. The brew method you choose is critical. So if we think about an espresso versus a filter coffee, we're probably looking at about 10 times the strength from the espresso to the filter coffee, German, like roughly speaking. We're gonna get hugely different body from this. So again, going back to those kind of highball styles, the sparkling spritz style drinks, this might work really well with a filter coffee because it's delicate, it's already got a little bit of length. And if you put espresso in there, it completely overpower the refreshing character of the drink. Whereas if you put a really delicate filter coffee, brewed at you know, 50, 60 grams per liter into something shaken, chances are you're gonna lose all of those coffee flavor notes in the drink because it's super light, it's already diluted, and you're not gonna get that intensity and punch that you want. You can also use things like cascara, but all of these variables are gonna to come together and affect how your coffee tastes and how it pairs with the cocktail that you're serving. Now, I'm not gonna introduce what processing is because I think everyone here has a good understanding of this, but I am gonna talk about how you can tie a processing method with ingredients on your shelf. So anyone who's following along today might wanna to think about this. I'd probably start brewing your coffee now as well because it's gonna be a couple of minutes until we start making the cocktails and going for the shake along. But thinking about the kind of three main processing methods to begin with, natural processed coffees, as you know, have more of those fruit notes, kind of the richer and kind of sweeter notes when compared to a pulp natural or a washed coffee. And you wanna think about how this would interact with a white spirit versus a kind of barrel aged dark spirit. So in my opinion, I would always pair a naturally processed coffee with something a little bit more intense, probably like a dark rum, whiskey, port, sherry. And that's what I'm gonna to do today. Um, purely because if you use a natural process with something uh, lighter, it's probably gonna overpower any of the clarity that you get from the lighter spirit. Whereas by pairing those big, intense, natural processed flavors, along with a big, intense coffee uh, spirit rather, they're gonna work really nicely together and overall elevate the intensity of the drink. So we're thinking back to those espresso martini style drinks and natural process, whether it's funky or just kind of really clean natural, is gonna work really well because re we really want to optimize that body to get the really nice, almost cappuccino, like texture that we're looking for in an espresso martini drink. So I'll talk more about what I'm gonna do for my espresso um, twist a little bit later on. But that's kind of a little peek towards what it's gonna be. So then we've spoken about natural process. What about pulp natural? And a pulp natural process is a really good all-rounder. I think we have to think about how this pairs with milk when we're baristas in the daytime. It works really well, great espresso, really well balanced. But also when we think about spirits, it has a much broader spectrum of spirits it can work well with. So it does work with your kind of barrel-aged spirits, your whiskey, your kind of more nutty, biscuity sherries, but it will also work with your lighter uh, sort of white rums, that kind of thing as well. And then finally, washed coffees. These, as we know, tend to be lighter, get that kind of citrus, the floral notes, a little bit more delicate and much cleaner. So we don't want to use big, powerful spirits like you know, peaty whiskey or any sort of really intense old barrel aged spirit because you're gonna lose all of those delicate notes, the washed coffee. So some examples I think work really well, vodka, gin, pisco, anything white that isn't aged probably more than a couple of years in barrel might work really nicely with this. And then going back a little bit earlier to what Marjorie was talking about, experimental processes, this is something you can really explore. So again, these can be quite cost prohibitive. So we don't want to use all of our experimental lots for cocktails. 
because we need to understand what's going on with the experiments so we can see how the steps taken on the farm can affect the cut. But that's not to say it's not valuable. So a drink I've served in the past for um, my routine in Berlin in 2019 was all based around an experimental process called the frozen natural process. And this was inspired by blood orange and ice wine. And ice wine is made by squeezing grapes that are still frozen when they've been picked off the vine. So you get all of that kind of rich, intense sweetness without any of the dilution from the frozen water that's still in the grape. And we paired this with blood orange, uh, malic acid, cascara, and obviously the frozen natural coffee. So by thinking about how these all work together, you can really bring a new and interesting flavor profile built around the process behind the drink. And this is something really important. You need to make sure when you build a drink, not only does it have a reason to exist, but it tells a story. So I don't just want to create a drink which will taste nice. This is a valuable thing, but it's not as valuable as if you can justify why you've made the drink, why each ingredient is there, and what it brings to the drink and how they work together. So that's something that I find really important. And that's kind of storytelling and linking, whether it's your processing, your production method, the origin of your ingredients, they might all come from the same part of the world. And then by doing this, you can really add value to the cocktails or the coffee cocktails that you serve. Now, so I love an espresso martini and I think it's the perfect cocktail to introduce consumers to coffee cocktails. It's not without its limitations. So as you can see, an espresso martini can be used with a very basic template, which I'll talk about in a second, but fundamentally it's coffee, coffee flavorings and sweeteners and spirit. So we're not gonna be really able to elevate the drink beyond the ingredients that are in it. So we talk about the coffee. This has to be incredibly good and incredibly fitting for the drink in order for the whole drink to taste good. Because if we have a core, a core ingredient which is poor, the rest of the drink can't be elevated by the other ingredients. The same applies for the coffee liqueur that you use, the spirit that you use, and the sweetener. So an outstanding espresso martini is incredible, but lots of espresso martinis aren't because people aren't using the very best ingredients they can find for the drink. So running through this template, it's kind of four, three, two, one. So 40 mils of espresso, or you can also use strong filter coffee if you're shaking along today. 30 mils of your spirit. And going back to the previous slides, obviously this can be pretty much any spirit. So we're assuming an ABV of around 40%. If it's a real high ABV above this, like an overproof rum, obviously you'd want to bring it down. If you're using a slightly lower ABV, you might want to slightly increase this. But this is a really good fundamental template, which I think is a really nice takeaway for building coffee cocktails around the espresso martini style. When it comes to the coffee liqueur, we, again, are driven by quality here. So there's a couple of different options on the market. I've got Cavalan, uh, Liquor 43, Mr. Black. There's also Tia Maria, Kahlua. There's lots of, of coffee liqueurs on the market but fundamentally you need to choose the one that fits with your coffee the best. And then finally your sweetener, you might want to either use a pre-made syrup, a bought syrup, a um, alternative sweetener, maybe agave, honey, that kind of thing. But whatever it is, they all need to tie nicely together. So as an example, a really nice kind of linear progression of an espresso martini variation I saw was espresso, which was from Mexico. We had tequila, um, and then we had agave. I don't think there was a coffee liqueur in there, but these are all things that tie in nicely together. So whatever you're going to be shaking today, make sure they work well together. And what I'm going to be using are the following. So the coffee is here. This is a natural Ethiopian called Chelelectu, which is really, really sweet, really fruity. Um, it has some kind of really nice dried fruits in there, the kind of raisin, date, sticky kind of molasses. I'm going to be using 30 ml of this incredible rum. So actually Marjorie might recognize this from El Salvador. This is a really popular El Salvadorian rum from the Pacas family, who are also coffee producers, as you'll probably know. I'm using Pedro Jimenez, which is a really sweet sherry. Tastes like raisins, dates, and it ties in really nicely with the rum. So rum and raisin, and then the coffee is probably a good bridge between the two. And then I'm using a caramel syrup from Monin which just really 
underpins the drink and just brings a little bit of required sweetness just to base it off and get the kind of balance of the drink right. So if everyone's there, pop some music on and we're gonna have a little shake along. So I should stand up for this really. So you're gonna need a shaker, You're also going to need a little bit of ice in a tin. And I'd always recommend a frozen glass if you can do. So it's really lovely, makes a big difference to the drink. And now we're gonna start. So pop in your espresso or your really strong filter coffee. Going back to what Joanna was talking about, the strong AeroPress is a good alternative for this. Gonna pop in 30 mils of our rum. Twenty mils of the Petro Jimenez. And ten mils of salted caramel syrup. This one's from Monin, it's very delicious. Now, we're gonna shake. So I'm gonna pour this out of the ice just to loosen it because it's been in the freezer. Give that a little whack. Make sure these are fastened together. If you don't have a tin, you can use a jam jar, you can use any kind of sealed vessel that you can shake in without any spillages. So now if everyone's ready, let's shake along. And it's really important you give it a really good shake. You can see the frost on the outside of the tin, and then you wanna get that really nice texture. So really good shake. Give it a little whack on the side to loosen the tin. And then, I'd always recommend fine straining an espresso martini style drink if you can, just to get rid of those shards of ice. Okay, and there we have a drink called r, &R which is a rum and raisin variation of an espresso martini, which I'm just gonna finish with a little squeeze of orange or lemon, this is lemon actually, a little bit of citrus over the top. And we should say thank you to Alex and all of the organizers for having us along today. So on behalf of everyone involved, Cheers. All right, Dan, thank you so much. Wow, that looks amazing. There it is. Mm. How does it taste? Very nice, if I say so myself. <laughs> Good, ingredients. Okay. Good ingredients. Of course, wow. I, we're, we were all sitting here just watching you and listening to you, uh, your, uh, your, your talk, and we were just fascinated with just all the different types of ingredients that you are mentioning. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just really nice, I think, to end on this kind of uh, on this note because um, I think it's just been a really uh, extremely interesting day for everyone and this is just the perfect way to end. So um, I would love to hear, so let's start with a couple of questions for you. Um, we were just joking, how big is your alcohol cabinet at home? Do you want me to show you? Yeah. All right, okay, bear with me. <laughs> yeah bro, go on. <laughs> I'm, I'm very lucky to have this, I'm not, I'm very aware of this. Me, uh, oh, it's not particularly tidy, but oh god, it looks like I'm posturing now. But yeah, just trophies, got, just trophies. I've got one very wonky shell. Oh, yeah, so it's wow. quite cool. <laughs> but that's yeah, that's, that's the accumulation of 10 years hoarding and collecting. So, I would love to hear, like, what was the kind of maybe was there like a kind of like a uh, an aha moment, as they always say, you know, where you had the first coffee cocktail uh, that really sparked your interest in this kind of uh, line of work and you actually thought, 
I want to get more into this. I want to try creating my own cocktails with coffee. Like, do you remember what that drink was maybe? Yeah, hundred percent. So oh, wow. um, there I was very much into coffee and very much into cocktails. And this was 2008, <laughs> bear in mind. So it's quite a long time ago. I just turned 18. Um, when I get into things, I tend to try and really learn as much as I can about them. Um, which again, is something that's probably a lot of people on here can relate to. And I thought, you know, these are two of my biggest hobbies. How can I bring the two together and create something that's not necessarily great in the sum of its parts, but an interesting flavor experience using these things. So that's okay. And then that was a couple of years kind of experimenting. And then in 2012, I did the UK coffee and good spirits for the first time. And I made a drink which had uh, a Colombian washed coffee, vanilla infused Shiraz, a Korean sweet potato liqueur called soju and some other stuff. And that was like my first interesting coffee drink, I think. But that was one that you made. I, I, I wanted to know if there was a, a moment in your life where you maybe went to a cocktail bar or you had a drink with a friend and they served you a coffee cocktail and you thought, damn, I need to get into this. Only an espresso martini. And actually a friend of mine made a Manuka honey espresso martini, which I was okay. like, that genius. Okay. The top. All right. Honey, unique. So can you maybe tell me what was the best coffee cocktail that you ever had uh, in a bar, maybe somewhere around the world? Because you obviously, you travel a lot uh, yeah. pre-corona times. Uh, you traveled a lot. What's, what was the best coffee cocktail that you ever had somewhere that was not your own? I think the one that surprised me the most was a pre-made espresso martini on tap. So a oh. friend in, in Malaysia. He was like, do you want a drink? Yeah, yeah. And he was like, there you go. <laughs> like, <laughs> zero effort. Obviously, a lot of effort went into it beforehand. But I thought that kind of elevated service was just so nice. What do you, what do you make of pre-mixed pre -mixed cocktails in general? Yeah, I'm all for it. I think, um, as long, particularly in the post-COVID world, I think our theatrical customer engagement piece is going to be fairly limited because I think sitting at a bar probably isn't going to be feasible for a long time, similar to a brew bar in a coffee shop. So if we can serve customers quickly and efficiently, particularly if they're in like a limited time capacity in a venue, that can only be good. And as long as we get consistency and quality through it as well, that's fine. So I have to say uh, one of the first uh, lockdown experiences that uh, Michael and I had was uh, we were actually at home and a friend of ours runs a really nice little cocktail bar in Amsterdam. They also do really good food and we ordered uh, Asian food and we got cocktails delivered in vacuum sealed bags. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them was actually an espresso martini. And uh, it was quite fun because we then just shook it and we served it. And uh, we just had this drink at home, which was in self isolation, but we still had this experience of a, a cocktail mixologist drink prepared for us, but then served in our own space. That was kind of a surreal experience, but also really cool. Yeah, there's pros and cons, I think. Um, the pros are exactly like unique experience. The con is you don't get the bar environment or the coffee shop environment, whatever it might be, of which course. is obviously part of this. Um, but yeah, for the current times, I think it's incredible. I know one of the businesses in China who I'm kind of friends with, I've done a bit of work with, they pivoted within about two weeks from coronavirus becoming a thing to being like a bottled or tinned actually cocktail delivery service to your door. Wow, that sounds crazy. So um, maybe we have some questions from the audience. Um, yes, so do you foresee a bigger upswing to it in coffee theme based non-alcoholic cocktails for use in coffee shops? Something to expand to the menus and creativity for non-drinkers. So there is a question about non-alcoholic beverages. I think, I think uh, Dan, you can probably see the questions in the Q&A yourself. Yeah, let me, um, yeah. I might just repeat it uh, briefly for everyone uh, who didn't hear what Michael just said, because he's sitting a little bit far away from me. Um, but do you uh, foresee a future in sort of non-alcoholic coffee, tea, cocktails uh, that people could uh, drink? Um, maybe kind of like a sort of, you know, a, a, an evolution of what you could see as maybe uh, iced lattes that are already in, available in tins or cold brew mm. or th something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the biggest barriers to coffee cocktails, or two of the biggest barriers to coffee cocktails are coffee and alcohol. Like, there's no good time really on paper to drink a coffee cocktail because yeah. either in the morning you're drunk except every day <laughs> so like i've made plenty of decaf coffee cocktails for myself when i've been practicing for competitions 
because you just, especially when you're making them over and over and over again, by the end of the day, oh, well, either by the end of the morning, you're drunk, or by the end of the day, you're just flying so like you can't sleep. Yeah. So yeah, um, non-alcoholic drinks for the mornings, absolutely. No uh, low caffeine drinks for the evening, 100%. I think that's a really big area of opportunity for coffee shops now. Yeah. And one that they, especially now, really need to make the most of. So I was writing a cocktail menu before lockdown for a place which had, for every drink on the menu, there'd be a non-alcoholic version and a decaf version. Wow. So that's, kind of drink that, something that's, that that's, a lot of, that's a lot of complexity, isn't it? Uh, substituting, really. So it's not, it's just taking one ingredient out, putting one in. But okay. for something that looks like this, it could be non-alcoholic and decaf, you know? So what would be what would be your um, because we before we went online we we were talking to each other and you said that you would uh, also provide a uh, non-alcoholic version of uh, the drink that you were uh, going to prepare today. Yeah. Um, what would be your perfect substitute ingredient for the alcohol in this drink? This one in particular, you can get. Um, so I've prepared this kind of thing before, so you can get non-alcoholic rum now, which oh, really? is it is a from seed lip. There's a few different ones. Um, there's one, I can't remember the name of the company, who mimic most spirits. So there's actually a non-alcoholic rum, which is quite cool. Um, wow. you, get, you don't get the same kick from the alcohol in terms of the flavor. <laughs> it's definitely not. For the Pedro Jimenez, you could use like a date syrup, and then you can stick to the syrup, so you can use your own sugar or whatever. Um, obviously using the decaf coffee. But then one of the things which I think in the post COVID world is going to be so important. And that has been kind of on my mind for a long time. We've got two shops next to each other. We've got a coffee shop, we've got a cocktail bar. The coffee shop opens at 7 a.m., closes at five. The cocktail bar opens at five and closes at two. Why aren't these two things together? Like, but there are places that do that already. Like I remember we were just talking earlier about uh, Shortage Grind, which was yeah. you know one of the first places that I remember as a cafe during the day, and then it turned into a cocktail bar after five, I believe. Um, but you, you know, as a cafe owner or as a as a as an establishment owner, that's also like crazy hours, right? You need to have a lot of staff coming in and out. You have a lot of dependencies. You need to have your baristas who are not yep. necessarily going to be mixologists at the same time as the mixologists are not going to be very skilled baristas. So you basically have to run two businesses under one roof, right? Yeah, which. You can even do, you can literally have two businesses under one roof. You could have um, a coffee shop and then a bar and you have ordinary shifts. They don't have to be cross-skilled, although the benefits of learning about alcohol definitely come over to coffee and vice versa. There are lots of things in common. And I think coffee and alcohol draw a particular type of person that does it because they enjoy it and they want to learn about nice things. So actually, as soon as you open someone's eyes to spirits or wine or chocolate, whatever it might be, then they will just think, oh, how can I compare coffee to this? How can I bring coffee into this? And it will only benefit each other, you know? So we had a very interesting uh, coffee uh, in one of our boxes recently um, uh, that was roasted by a Romanian roastery called Meron. And it was a 96-hour uh, anaerobic fermented Brazilian coffee. And we sent uh, some of these bags to customers in the Middle East and uh, they were saying to me afterwards that um, even though they don't get alcohol there necessarily, this coffee was basically a very, very good replacement for a, uh, an aged rum because it had a lot of the qualities from, from that drink. Uh, so this could also be a good replacement, right? For um, if you have a very sort of experimental coffee that has those qualities uh, as a replacement for your alcohol in this, in this drink because you might still get some of those flavor notes. You can even barrel aged coffee, which is something I've seen done before. I've seen green coffee barrel aged, and I've also seen brewed coffee whacked into a barrel for a few days. Um, oh, wow. You can get a similar result, which isn't as pure by using wood chips, so burning the wood chips and putting them into your brew, but you kind of lose the kind of clarity of the coffee doing this. Whereas if you put it into a barrel, you might just get something a little bit more natural, the kind of natural vanillins from the wood. Yep. But yes, yeah, right. for sure. And booze you know, uh, coffees are boozy, so. Okay, let's get another question from the audience. So, what's the best method for making drinks pair well with coffee? Okay, what, what are the best non-alcoholic drinks that pair with coffee? I mean, we already know things like tonics. So mm -hmm. you have uh, cold brew tonic, you have uh, 
things like, uh, uh, you know, you even have a cold brew gin and tonic, for example, but uh, what are the sort of best non-alcoholic non drinks that you compare with, with coffee and, and what would be that coffee? Would it be an espresso or would it be a filter, ro uh, filter coffee? Um, tea would be a good answer. There's a huge range of complexity in tea that ties together quite nicely with coffee. It's quite a delicate balance to find, for sure. But what would be your, what would be your go-to tea in, if you were to pair it with coffee? I've, one of the coolest drinks I've made before, which was a long time ago now, was a non-alcoholic coffee old-fashioned. So that was Lapsang Souchong tea. Uh, it was a long time ago. Espresso, cherry juice, ice. So as yeah. you stir it down, it got sweeter. And for some other stuff. All right, so this, this is perfectly on time. Hold the thought, because we are just getting our own espresso martinis. Yes. From the guys here at the Hoxton. Which is amazing, by the way. I've been there before. It is amazing, right? Yeah. So I would like to also um, just welcome the wonderful assistants that, we, that <coughs> have helped me today. So <laughs> here we go. So we're going to have a toast uh, with everyone. Michael and Martin, please join. Actually, uh, I'm more the, more the sort of, uh, I'm more the dirty martini kind of person, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, actually, it's for you. It I is for espresso yeah. martini. But let me have you at least a sip. Let me have a sip. Yeah. <laughs> you had too much coffee. <laughs> I would like to say a toast <laughs> to all of the speakers. Cheers. Thank you, Dan, for this Cheers, amazing Dan. presentation. Cheers. And uh, <laughs> thank you guys for being the most wonderful assistants I could have wished for. Cool. And uh, thank you to the Hoxton for these drinks that came just on time. Yeah. Let's have a toast. Yes. Alex. Cheers, Dan. Oh. Give back my um, drink. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> all right. So um, let's before we before we uh, finish, let's uh, quickly check if we have any more questions from the audience, and uh, then. Uh, actually, uh, talking about drinks, uh, let's ask our public. Uh, maybe they wanted to share what are their favorite uh, favorite drinks. So I'm launching a poll. Oh yeah. What's your favorite uh, go-to coffee cocktail? All right. I have to say, I did this uh, based on uh, uh, some uh, cocktails that I found uh, with a quick Google search. <laughs> Yeah. So they might not be the best uh, representatives, but um, I thought these would be uh, some, some good ones to choose for this poll. Let's hear what people have to say. All right. Oh, this drink is well deserved. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's see the results. A few more seconds. A, co a couple more seconds. Yeah. Oh, this cocktail is amazing. It's amazing. It tastes a little bit like... Um, what do... Sugar puffs. All right, let's see the results, guys. Okay, so. Ha! Ooh. Mm. Espresso martini. Okay, espresso martini is pretty high up. I can't, I, might, I don't have my glasses on. What is the third one that? Uh, the third one, uh, Irish coffee and Execo cold brew gin tonic and espresso old fashioned. All right. And no one knows dark and stormy espresso. <laughs> Do you know this one, Dan? Dark and stormy espresso. Yeah, so rum, ginger beer, a little bit of coffee. It's nice. Can you take Sure. Sorry, guys, can you take the results of the screen? Otherwise, I can't yeah. see Dan. Yes, go ahead. It's my fifth favorite on the list. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. With um, a good, there's a rum called Crosslings. Uh, by the way, I might say, so, uh, Dan, you're very, very lucky that you just had a baby because uh, if you were uh, anywhere near, we would probably have to storm your house and drink your uh, cabinet dry. <laughs> <laughs> very bad location for, for, for a big house party, I can tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, he had to be uh, shipped off to his grandparents. That's so peace and quiet for a minute. <laughs> uh, what, can you show that rum again? Gosling, mm. I feel really dark rum. Works nicely with cold brew, a little bit of ginger beer, a little bit of lime. It's amazing. So uh, just one, uh, one thing uh, from me and then one more question before we uh, finish for the day. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your coffee cocktail Friday? Uh, yeah, so this is something I've been doing, just encouraging people to play around with coffee cocktails really. So anyone who creates a coffee cocktail, ideally on a Friday, um, what, pop the hashtag on there and that means I see it because I follow the hashtag. I try and give a little bit of um, encouragement or feedback or advice if anyone wants it. Drop me a message and it's just an excuse to drink on a Friday, really. <laughs> I, I want people to enjoy it because they're great. I'm a big believer in coffee cocktails and I think so many people in lockdown need distraction and alcohol. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. Uh, so it's a nice kind of thing to focus on at a certain time, you know. Do you also do um, like live Instagram videos or something where you do uh, cocktail workshops or anything like that? 
Yeah, I've done a few master classes with Monin, um, and then there's a few other partnerships which I'll be entering soon, which will right. be fun as well. So keep us posted. I will do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. One more question from the audience, and then it's time to end for this wonderful day. Yes, we would like to thank you guys um, also for your presentation, which is. Uh, Viewing us from Latvia, Scotland, and Argentina, and Andres Perez. Now we know who signed up the uh, three tickets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we had a triple. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, last question. So, how can we contact you, Dan? Aliosa, Aliosa, she's asking um, uh, about the contact details because she has some questions about coffee liqueurs. All right. Yeah. Um, Instagram is probably the best way. Uh, at Dan Fellows One. Um, yeah, that's. That's why drop me a message. I'm Perfect. always happy to talk booze and coffee. All right. So if you want to ask Dan a question, just uh, find him on Instagram and uh, use the, the hashtag uh, Coffee Cocktail Fridays to uh, show, uh, show off your own um, mixing skills of shaking your coffee and uh, making delicious cocktails. So I would like to thank everyone for joining us here today. Thank you, Dan. It was wonderful to see you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Nice Cheers. So uh, just a few. Just a couple of uh, closing words uh, on this uh, wonderful Sunday afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining us here today, for being so dedicated and for being supportive. Um, it's been a real, real pleasure to have all these wonderful speakers here today. And uh, yeah, I'm very honored that I've had the opportunity to speak with everyone here today, to uh, host this event at the Hoxton. Um, very grateful for my wonderful supporters uh, here live in person. Uh, for Leonard Clerks, Marjorie Kanjura, uh, Joanna Al, Maxwell Colonna Dashwood, and Dan Fellows for joining us today at this event. Uh, you will be seeing, as we end today, you will be seeing a, a, a survey, which I'd kindly ask you to fill in, because it'll provide us some more information about how we did today, and also what you think about this concept, and whether you think um, we should do more of this, or less of this, or none of this. Um, and also, we'd love to hear uh, any additional feedback that you might have. So, uh, in that spirit, coffee and good spirits, I would like to end with a little toast to you all. Thank you for being here today. Come on, guys. Right, One last toast. <laughs> One last toast. And don't forget yeah. to post your favorite drink you prepared today uh, under <laughs> hashtag virtual coffee festival. Yes. Waiting for your pictures. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Use hashtag virtual coffee festival and tag us at virtual coffee festival. Thank you so much for being here today. Cheers and see Cheers. you. Goodbye.